My name's James Long. Uh, you can call me Jay. Everyone does. I spent 10 years in the Marine Corps. I uh, went in right after high school. I was in the infantry. I uh, deployed twice with them. Uh, while I was in, I got my degree in wildlife biology. Uh, after I was medically retired out of the Marine Corps, I went to work for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. I worked at uh, Guadalupe River State Park and Lake Somerville State Park. I ran their drawn hunts. I did natural resource work. And at Lake Somerville, I managed their trailway and their public hunting land. I did that for almost five years uh, before I started working for Texas A&M NRI, uh, doing this feral hog work. Um, while, I'm, while I'm doing this, I'm also uh, pursuing my master's in wildlife biology. So I'm, I'm a little on the younger side, but I've been around, I've been doing this work for a while, and uh, I've, I've been able to gain some insight going all over the world. Uh, and I appreciate you all coming here today and uh, listening to us talk. So today we're going to talk to you about the Feral Swine Control Pilot Program. Hopefully after today we can get some more of you signed up and help uh, put a dent in the population here in the county. So today we're going to cover distribution and damage, uh, biology and environmental impact. We're going to cover some laws around uh, feral hogs, the take and the transportation of them. Uh, we're going to talk about some reduction methods, and then we're going to get into the project background behind the TRAP loan program. Uh, we're going to look at the coordinated efforts and the monitoring, and then I also have some success metrics uh, for the counties uh, in the phase one program. So to start off, we're going to look at uh, distribution. So this map is the feral swine population from 1982 by county. As you can see, it's mostly in the west and southern part of the U.S. Over here, nearly 40 years later, uh, the feral swine populations in 2021 by county, th this has grown exponentially. It has covered everything up and has slowly moved north. Out west, it's slowly moving east. And funny enough, Texas reports only one county out there in the far west without feral hogs. Now, I don't know about any of you guys, I've never met a feral hog that can tell a county line. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know how they determine that, that that little area out there is hog free, especially since most of the counties around it have hogs in it, uh, but I guess we'll take their word for it. So as we're talking, uh, this is just a blown up map of the Texas distribution. As I was saying, as of 2019, 99% of Texas counties have wild pigs in them. And as you can see, that's a pretty uh, large increase from 1982. All right, so livestock or wildlife? Has, has anyone, do, do, everyone here probably thinks of wild pigs as wildlife out on, the, uh, out on your property, right? But we define it as livestock. It is the property of the landowner, unlike deer, or other, other wildlife like that, which is the property of the state. So what you do with the wild pigs is up to you. You catch them, you can sell them, you can dispatch them there on your property. They're, they are classified as the same thing as wild, wild cattle or wild goats. And that's important when it comes to reducing their numbers. Agricultural damage. So we're gonna get into the damage that they've done and the damage that they do across the landscape. Has anyone here heard the 52 million number? It's a, it's a very popular number for years and years that wild pigs did $52 million worth of damage annually to uh, agricultural and livestock. That number has changed and it has increased dramatically. According to new studies, the total agricultural damages are greater than 100 million annually. And annual wild pig damages in Texas are conservatively estimated around $230 million. Now that, does, that number does not include uh, when you like hit a wild pig going down the road and the damage it does to your vehicle and insurance damages and stuff like that. And then landowners spend right around $7 million annually on wild pig control and damage mitigation here in Texas. So that's the trapping of wild pigs, the dispatching of wild pigs, that's fixing the damage they've done to your property, 
Um, that's changing practices because of wild pigs. That number sits at around 7 million. Now, there's a belief that that number could be much higher, uh, especially as, the, as products continue to rise in price. Uh, but that's the number we've um, kind of uh, agreed to at, at this point. And one big problem with this number, though, that I always like to bring up is oftentimes this number is lower because landowners don't put two and two together with how much they're actually spending because of the damage that wild pigs have done. So they might say, well, I lost $5,000 worth of crop this year, but they don't talk about the money it spent to clear that crop out, the money it spent to fix the field, the gas that went in, the gas or diesel that went into your implements, um, the time, your own time spent doing it. And so that dramatically lowers what that number could actually be. All of that is hog damage. And it does not take very long, long for them to get into a field and do that. And sadly, if you're just driving by, you might not be able to see that damage at first. This is one of my favorite videos to watch how they'll tear apart the round bales like that. And that's kind of where I get back to, you know, a landowner might see that and might think of how much that round bale cost them, but they don't take into account how much it costs them to make that round bale, run the implements, uh, the um, twine used to tie it together, uh, the diesel fuel it took to get it out onto your field, and all of that that actually went into the loss of that round bale. Has anyone ever hit a pig? It's surprising how much damage they'll do too. And that's another area where we do a, a bad job of keeping records of how much damage is actually done, uh, just like when you hit a deer going down the road. All right, so now we're gonna get into a little bit of their biology and why they've become such a problem. Population boom. So as you saw from the distribution map, in that 40 years, they went from covering a little less than half of the state to covering basically the whole state. Well, how does that happen so fast? Part of it is because they reach maturity so quickly. Females, as soon as it's been documented that females as soon as six months can have a litter of piglets. Now, that's kind of an extreme number. We normally lean to a year. A year at a year for females and a year for males is when you'll start seeing them reproduce. But they do have a short gestation, only 115 days. That means that they can have two, maybe three uh, litters a year if they're, if they're really pushing it. No defined mating season. They have few predators. I mean, think about it. We've done a pretty good job as uh, humans out on uh, the landscape of getting rid of anything naturally that could predate on pigs. We, we destroyed the wolf population. We've taken care of mountain lions. We were constantly shooting coyotes. Anything that could predate on pigs or piglets we're, we're kind of what's left. And so if we're not out there taking care of them, they're just going to continue to be allowed to boom. And they have easy access to feed meant for wildlife and livestock. Who all here hunts? How many times have you gone up to your feeder and there's been pigs eating the corn that you bought for the deer? That's, that's free food for them. They don't have to fight for it. They don't have to scavenge for it. They don't have to root around for it. They're just filling their belly off the money you put on the ground. And all that leads to bigger and healthier pigs that could have more babies going down the road. And the one thing they all have in common, and one of the big reasons why they are such a problem across the US and here in Texas specifically, is because they all need water. Does anyone, have, does anyone know why they need water? why they are linked to water. Exactly, they don't sweat. It's 
So why is water so important? They lack sweat glands. Water is how they thermoregulate. And they accomplish that by wallowing, uh, occupying shaded areas, and nocturnal feeding. That's another reason why it's such a hard a time to control their population numbers. A lot of times, though, especially here in Texas in the summer, when it gets so hot that walking outside makes you feel like you just took a bath, they go nocturnal, and a lot of people don't want to get up at midnight, 1 a.m. to go out after them. And you can just see, if you look around the bank, you can see how they destroy that bank. And they just, they just slowly get sediment and material off into the water. Same thing here again. Destroying the grass, destroying the banks, making everything dirty. And so that's when we get into water quality impairments. The loss of riparian areas. A big one that I always like to point out because it's not often touched on is the increased in run, increase in runoff and sedimentation. So everyone talks about E. coli and the diseases and stuff that they can put into the water, but oftentimes we glass over the fact that all that wallowing they do destroys the native grasses that hold the banks together and allows for thousands and thousands of pounds of soil every year to get off into the water and go and we lose it to the Gulf and that makes it harder and harder for native grasses to come back it makes it harder and harder for the rivers and streams to repair themselves and again that's just land that you lose it's gone it, once it gets into the water goes down the Gulf uh, we, we can't get it back and then obviously as I said before the bacterial contamination E. coli other diseases they might have um, also, as I spoke to, um, they'll, they'll tear up the native grasses and the way they tear it up, there are some invasive grasses and plants that actually thrive on that torn up and uh, exposed ground and wet area like Chinese tallow. And once they ta it takes over, it's harder for that native grasses to come back. And I don't know if any of you have tried to treat or get rid of Chinese tallow it's not a fun job and it's not a one-time go out easy job either wildlife impacts so what, what would you rather have wild hogs or birds geckos even snakes native native animals out on your landscape Wild pigs will go through and they'll eat ground nesting birds, they'll take down fawns, they'll take down amphibians, reptiles, any, just about anything they can get their hands on, they will destroy. They'll destroy habitat. And then they'll compete with native wildlife for resources. At the end of the day, everyone's property has a carrying capacity. If, if you have 10 acres or 100 acres, there's a carrying capacity to what your land can hold. How much habitat you have, how much water you have, how much natural food is abundant on your property. And now there's things we can do to increase or decrease that carrying capacity, but wild hogs take up a big chunk of that carrying capacity. So the more and more of them you have on your property, the less and less you can have the things you want, like whitetail, uh, foxes, I know so, some people here probably don't enjoy them. I enjoy seeing bobcats out on, out on the landscape. And then another big problem, especially here in Texas, where cattle operations are so important to so many landowners, is the wild pigs and livestock interaction. Has anyone ever seen this out on their property? I tell you, I, those wild pigs, they're, they're, they're some brave little guys. I've, they'll go right up to cows, right up to horses, Wild pigs and disease concerns. Swine brucellosis. This is a big problem, especially for cattle producers and uh, people who run cattle on their properties because it can cause a false positive for bovine brucellosis. That's, that's a horrible thing to happen and it's, it's not hard for it to happen either. Pseudo rabies can cause neurological symptoms and death in livestock and pets. 
This is a big deal when, it come, when you come to talk about uh, dogs or cats you might have as pets and children. If you have kids, grandkids running around your property where they can, get, they can come into contact with wild hogs, uh, the pseudo rabies, while it's not normally uh, deadly, it can cause some serious neurological symptoms um, that would just be horrible for, uh, and is worse for little kids. And then tick-borne diseases. I don't know about any of you, but even in the coldest, the last two cold spells we had where I shot hogs, they still had ticks on them. And three, three out of four wild pigs in Texas are potentially infested with ticks capable of disease transmission. Has, has anyone here heard about the tick that can give you, make you allergic to red meat? The Lone Star tick can bite you and make you allergic to red meat. Now, I don't know about any of you, but that'd be, a, that'd be a bad day for me. So that's another reason why we want to get these animals off of our landscape and keep them from uh, transmitting diseases to our livestock, our pets, our kids, and ourselves. Just a couple examples of interactions. You have one with the horse over there, and then you have them getting into a feed pen over here. All right, so before we get into laws, we're gonna have a little pop quiz to see how much you guys already know. Do you need a hunting license to hunt wild pigs? No. You do not need a hunting license to hunt wild pigs with the caveat of on private land with permission, with permission yes if you're going to hunt public hunting land here in the state of texas you still need a hunting license now another thing i always like to bring up with that is is there anyone here who leases their land out to hunters so you are the king of your land you can still require hunters to have a hunting license to hunt wild pigs. And we, I always like to bring that up because uh, here at NRI, we have a saying that you are the king and queen of your land. It's your rules. And for liability reasons, we normally suggest if you're going to lease it out, it's a, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a fairly cheap license to go get. Can you move wild pigs across county lines? Yes, you can, as long as you're moving it to a controlled, uh, to a approved holding facility, or bores to a approved hunting facility. With that in mind, you cannot take it across your across the county line to a neighbor you don't like. Please, I, I know I know some of these counties around here might give you a hard time, but you, you can't be doing that. Can you release wild pigs once they're caught? Even then, you can, it's only at an approved hunting facility. Yeah. But then they still have to be tested. Right? Exactly. But generally, you cannot. So that's, a, that's another thing. Once you decide to start trapping pigs, it's a commitment. You can't just trap a bunch of pigs and say, you know, I don't feel like dealing with this today. Open the gate and let them go. And then are toxicants legal in Texas? No, they're not. So, straight from the outdoor annual, uh, the hunting license went into effect in September of 2019. It applies to both resident and non-resident hunters. And as I said before, the licenses are still required on all public lands. Currently, there are no legal toxicants here in Texas. We do have two uh, toxicant baits that are currently under research. Uh, they're being researched for delivery methods and to see if they can, uh, for pass on to animals that might come across the carcass uh, and eat on them after they've been taken. Uh, that's mine and Josh's hunting vehicle. Uh, we'd like to thank the, the state of Texas for uh, allowing us to get that. No, I'm joking. Even if, even if we did have it, we couldn't afford ammo for it right now. All right, so a couple legal, legal options for control uh, of wild pig population. Trapping, snaring, shooting, aerial gunning, and trained dogs. 
The first one we're going to get into is trapping, which also happens to be probably one of the most effective ways of reducing population numbers across the landscape. It captures large groups. It allows you to transport and the sale of live pigs. Uh, you can combine it with other methods. Some of the disadvantages to it is it is time intensive and there is a material cost to it that doesn't come with some of the other ways. With trapping, there's two big things that need to be done to be successful. Pre-baiting and the use of cameras. So with pre-baiting, what you want to do is you want to you get the pigs accustomed to the bait, not accustomed to the trap. So the first, thing, the first thing I normally like to do is pick an area where I'm going to trap. Maybe it's an area that I know pigs come through. Maybe it's an area near water so I know the pigs will be there. And I'll bait them. I'll, I'll put bait down before I ever build a single part of the trap. And then comes the second part, the cameras. We need to know when it's time to build the trap. We need to know when it's time to set the trap. So you set the cameras up. And once you see that you start having pigs come into the bait, then you can go out there and you can build your trap. And then once the trap's built and you're still baiting, you check the camera again. And once the pigs, once you're getting the whole group of pigs in, or at least you think you're getting the whole sounder in, then you set the trap and you're ready to trap those pigs. You don't want to tra try trapping one or two pigs at a time or half the sounder, because now you've created trap smart pigs and it's going to be harder and harder to get them to come to those traps. This is a basic corral trap. You have your head gate up there made out of wood. Um, it uses a tire trigger. So basically the way it is is they set that head gate up. They tie a rope off to that tire. They'll fill the tire up with some corn. Once they start kicking that tire around, it'll set that uh, head gate off and you've caught uh, you've caught your sounder. Uh, you can adjust the sensitivity of it by getting a bigger tire, bigger or smaller tire. Uh, and you want to make sure that it's in the back two thirds of the uh, back one third of the trap. Box trap. Now box traps are nice. They're easier to move around, especially if you're one person. Uh, they're a little less expensive. Here's the big problem with box traps is the amount of pigs you're going to catch. I mean, look, looking at the size of that, you're going to get maybe one or two big pigs in there or just a whole lot of the little piglets. Snaring is a great option um, for your problem pigs. So let's say you have a pig out on your property that you just can't get to come into a trap, uh, but you know where they're coming in and out of your property on. Uh, it's a great option for, doing, for using it for that. Unfortunately, for numbers wise, it's not a great option because how many pigs can you catch with that snare? One pig. One pig at a time. Another big problem with snares is accidental take. Once you put out a snare on your property, is there any way for you to say, hey, only a pig goes in there? Uh, I like to bring that up because one, if you do decide to snare, I suggest you have a hunting license. Uh, just in case you do take something that isn't a pig. But two, there are ways to uh, help reduce the, uh, the chance of accidental take. So who's ever seen a pig rubbing themselves up against a telephone pole? They love to get that creosote up on them. Has anyone ever seen a deer do that? Or a fox or a coyote? I I've, I've only ever seen pigs do that. So setting up a snare around that will help reduce that, uh, that accidental take. Setting up a snare on a, on a line where you've only seen pigs coming in and out under a gate will help uh, reduce accidental take. So there are ways to reduce that. This is, a, a good, and this is also a good way of um, pressuring pigs to keep them out of an area for a short amount of time. Shooting. Ultimately, shooting is a low harvest method. The average person uh, who doesn't do it every day, who doesn't do it for a living, even if you combine suppressors and thermals or night vision, if you go out to a field and there's 20 pigs in the field, how many of them do you think you could accurately take by yourself? 
maybe three, four, five at most, if it's a big field and you're real fast. Um, it is the most fun method, though. I will say that. It's also another method that's good for pressuring hogs off of a piece of property. So again, uh, while the ultimate goal is reduction of the population, there are, some of these methods can be used to help pressure hogs off of a piece of property to give those ground nesting birds a chance to get off the ground. Uh, maybe you just planted a crop and you just need some time for it to break through the soil. Uh, these, are, these are methods that you can use to help keep them off your property for a short amount of time. Now that might be two weeks, that might be a month. I can promise you they're gonna come back, uh, but it does give you a window of opportunity. Aerial gunning. Besides trapping, aerial gunning is probably, in all honesty, aerial gunning is probably the most effective way to get, land, to get um, a large number of pigs off a of landscape at one time. However, it is very expensive. That $800 to $1,000 an hour uh, number is an old number. It is much, expen much more expensive now. Uh, we're going to talk uh, towards the end of this about um, the success that USDA Wildlife Services has had with their aerial gunning and their direct take. Um, it is a very effective way of doing it, uh, but for normal times when you, we don't have these programs going, it is a very expensive way that most landowners don't ha necessarily have the means to get done. You know, you know I've I, I ask them every time I see them, and they still won't let me get up in the, in the helicopter with them. I don't know why. And then lastly, trained dogs. So I like to tell the story that my boss told me about him. He was giving a similar talk to a group uh, in another county, and he, we, he got to the trained dogs, and he started talking about how low, how ineffective trained dogs are for actual population control. And there was a group of gentlemen in the back who just got up and left. And so after the, after the presentation, he went and found them and talked to them, and they were telling them that they, they, they'll go out and take 30, 40, 50 pigs a night with their with their dogs. Again, as I talked to, as I uh, spoke about with the shooting and the gentleman in the back, that that is a exception to the rule, not the rule. Trained dogs, while it's fun to hunt with dogs, how many, how, realistically, three, maybe four pigs in a night uh, for trained dogs, because the dogs have, you have to find the pigs, the dogs have to catch them, hunter has to get in close and it dispatch the uh, pig, and then you got to hope that none of your dogs got hurt. Got to hope they're not too tired to go on. Uh, there's a lot of elements that go in that make this usually a low harvest method. But again, it is another effective method in pressuring wild pigs out of an area for a short amount of time. All right, now we'll get into uh, the reason everyone came here today, the trap loan program and we'll talk a little bit about the project background. So this program stems from the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, there was concerns over the increasing feral swine in the U.S. and their damages uh, done. <coughs> Agricultural, agriculture, ecosystems, human and animal health, and there were funds were, that were allocated to 20 projects in 10 states. So we're not, Texas isn't the only state trying to uh, put a stop to the feral swine population boom. Uh, we're one of many states and we're one, of, the Trap Loan Project is one of many projects currently going right now to help reduce the number of wild pigs out on the landscape. Couple key components. So the feral swine removal by APHIS, uh, this is linked with your local, local water conservation district. So the way, the way this program works right now is your local water conservation district uses fund money to buy the traps. And then a wildlife technician will help set the, once you decide to sign on to the program, it will help, help set the trap up, show you how to use the trap, and let you use the trap on your land to catch pigs. 
Second way of doing it is direct control. That is your aerial gunning, your night hunting, and things along those lines. That's where the, uh, the techs will come out and they'll either aerial gun your property or they'll night hunt your property with thermals and suppressors. And as we'll talk about in a minute, they have great success doing that. And then restor restoration efforts supported by NRCS. I I'd like to bring this up uh, and make a point about this. Uh, we actually just had a meeting with a bunch of the partners um, that are involved in the pilot program. And this is something that uh, more landowners need to be made aware of, is the restoration efforts that are supported by NRCS around this program. So there's assistance to producers for feral swine control efforts via NRCS grants with non-federal partners. And I believe there's gonna be more information coming out about that. Um, so look out for that as well. So monitoring objectives. Understanding successes are a big part of this project. So what part of this project is reducing the number of feral hogs, seeing, seeing how landowners uh, adopt the methods that are, are given to them, the trap loan program, uh, and then the education that we, that we provide at, as NRI. Uh, landowners' personal efforts to manage feral swine. So it's important for us to learn and understand how land, uh, you as landowners are out there uh, controlling the feral swine population on your property. Uh, and after talking to landowners all across the state, you know, there's some landowners who are very big about it. They're like, I'm out there trapping every day. I go out hunting. I'm actively trying to put an impact. And then there are landowners who are uh, absentee landowners who only come down for the weekend or maybe only come down for deer season. And their neighbors are, are like, every time I try to take pigs out, the pigs go onto my neighbor's place. They hang out for a month or two and then they come right back. And so it's important for us to understand the dynamics behind that. And then gathered uh, information on damage to crop and crop conversion, uh, livestock, property, surface damage, and stored commodities. And there is another group that's involved in this uh, effort who is uh, gathering that information. Trap loan program contacts. So the, the big guy for this area is David Pipkin. Uh, he would not be the first person I call, but he is a contact uh, that you can uh, call if you have more information, if you want more information about the program. Is Lane, is Lane here? So Lane Schlotman is your trap loan technician for this county. Uh, and then our direct control technicians, Jared Creasy, back there. And so at, um, at, after this program, while we're having lunch, please feel free to go talk to them. They can get you signed up for the programs today. Um, they can give you more information about how they run it. And then after, the, after this and after lunch, we're going to have a trap demonstration where we're actually going to show you the trap uh, that the local water board bought and would be used for the trap loan program. Uh, current successes. So this is the most recent data that we have available. Uh, last fiscal year for feral swine removal. Uh, for direct control methods, so again, that's your aerial gunning, uh, your nighttime shooting, and things like that, 18,663 between October uh, 2020 and September 2021. That is for uh, the pilot, uh, that is for phase one, so that's um, the Red River area, uh, Leon River area, and the Canadian River area. So. So it's, it's roughly, I think it's eight counties, nine counties, eight. There's four here. There's, there's four here. There's two in the Canadian River and two in Leon River, I believe. And in trap loan program, uh, just under 1,800 pigs. And again, uh, the big reason why there's a discrepancy between those numbers, uh, not, not just because 
uh, you might be a, you might be able to get a little bit more with aerial gunning is because of landowner participation. Uh, the traps are there, uh, but this isn't the first county we've been to where they where they they tell us, you know, we bought four traps and we're only using two of them, and the other two are just sitting. Uh, I can tell you these are high dollar, very pricey traps that work very well. Uh, if you have a chance to get one of these on your property for almost no cost to you. I, it, it's important to jump on it because uh, the trap we have out in the parking lot, which you'll see, uh, was $8,200. All right, a couple of resources. Um, did it, if you didn't get a chance to come up and get a USB drive, please feel free to come up and get one. Uh, it has a bunch of uh, NRI's publications on wild pigs uh, about damage they do, about ways to trap them, about best practice methods. Um, you can also come visit Wild Pigs, uh, our Wild Pig website. Uh, that has links to all of the publications that we have on the USB. Um, it also will have updated publications uh, that we might not have on the USB right now. Uh, we have a publication getting ready to come out. Um, the big, the big po point of these publications is to help the landowners of Texas be, hopefully be one step ahead of what's coming down the pipeline. So he talked about uh, Afri African swine fever. You know, it, it's, not a, it's not a thing here in, a, in the US quite yet. It hasn't become a problem here yet. But what we don't want is it for, to become a problem and then we're studying it, then we're trying to figure out how to handle it and we're, uh, you know, we're chasing after it. And then we also have our YouTube channel uh, where we go over uh, how to build a corral trap. Uh, we talk about is it safe to eat wild pigs. Um, we talk about kind of how to prepare them. Um, just about anything you want to know about wild pigs, we probably have a video on it. Um, and then our feral hog Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we, uh, we ask to please come and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we post about when we're, where we're going to be, what counties we're going to be giving presentations in. Uh, we also post new information uh, as we find it. Uh, we try our best to make sure that it's uh, scientifically accurate and it's been vetted. Um, and then we also uh, post about things going on across the state of Texas in regards to uh, wild pigs. Something. Project funding. Uh, so we're funded through... Uh, USDA and the Natural Resources Conservation Service grant, and it's administered by the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. So our goal is, as NRI is to come out to the, uh, the counties that are part of this uh, program, uh, educate you all on why feral pigs are such a problem, even though I know you all already know that they're a problem on your property, and educate you about the programs and the resources that are available to help you as landowners uh, hopefully combat this problem. So all these QR codes work. I'll leave this up on the screen for a while. If you want to uh, follow it to find us on Facebook, Twitter, or find our Wild Pigs website. Um, the Facebook and the Twitter is kept up to date fairly regularly. Uh, we are currently in the process of updating our website. It does have all of our publications and stuff on there, uh, but in the near future, it'll start having our uh, programming dates on there on a calendar as well.